And my political views are an intrinsic part of my view of the truth and, and of how I see life. The label Marxist, which was put on you, I mean, do you see that in any way helpful? I have claimed myself to be a Marxist. I mean, it's not something that I deny. Mm. Well, what I mean by that is that my reading of Marx uh, from a very early age helped me enormously to understand history and therefore to understand where we are in history and therefore to understand uh, huh, what we have to envisage as a future thinking about human dignity and justice. In that sense, is it still helpful today? If we look at what is happening to the world uh, and the decisions being taken every day, and all, all those decisions were really made in the name of one priority, uh, that priority of increasing, ever-increasing profit. At that moment, Marx doesn't seem quite so obsolete, does he? In your heart, you're a storyteller, aren't yes. you? That's what you are. Yes, I completely agree with you. I mean, if, I, I feel that I'm a storyteller. That's all. That's all, storyteller. But the trouble with storytellers is they can be, they can be seen as very dangerous. Uh, well, dangerous to what and to whom? That's the, that's the question. Um, um, if I am dangerous to those who uh, run the new economic order, I'm proud of that. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rev Left Radio. Today we have back on the show for, I don't know, the fourth, fifth, sixth time, my good friend John, a.k.a. the Lit Crit Guy, this time to talk about the work of British Marxist art critic and polymath John Berger. Uh, as we mentioned in the, in the episode, Berger is somebody who might be well known throughout Europe and the Middle East, but is not so much well known here in North America and in the States specifically. We hope to correct that a little bit uh, with this episode. Um, but yeah, just a fascinating figure and life and an important Marxist thinker that we should all sort of pay homage to and learn from. Um, so this is a really interesting conversation with a great friend of mine and of Rev Lefts, and I think you will all enjoy it. As always, if you like what we do here at Rev Left Radio, you can join us at patreon.com forward slash Rev Left Radio. We are 100% listener funded, always have been, always will be. Um, it's how me and, and producer Dave feed our children and pay our bills, and it means the absolute world to us. And in exchange for your support on Patreon, you get access to uh, bonus monthly content. Um, just this last month, for example... I interviewed my, uh, my 14-year-old niece and 12-year-old daughter on feminism, on what it's like to be a child, uh, you know, a, a preteen, a teenager uh, uh, in today's world, and just got a really interesting perspective from a point of view that you almost never hear from unless you have a, a preteen girl in your life. And I, I really am proud of that, and the patrons really seem to love it. So that's just what's the most recent, but every month we try to do something unique and different and give back to those who give so generously to us. So without further ado, here's my discussion on the life and work of John Berger with John, a.k.a. the Lit Crit Guy, co-host of Horror Vanguard, and friend of mine. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. My name is uh, John. On the internet, I go by the Lit Crit Guy. Um, I have been lucky enough to come on Rev Left a few times before. We've covered a whole host of really uh, interesting conversations. So I'm a, a writer and a teacher from the north of England. I'm a, a Marxist. I'm the co-host of the gothic Marxist podcast Horror Vanguard, where we talk about horror movies, uh, leftist politics, and cultural theory. You can find us uh, wherever good po wherever you get your podcasts from. Um, and uh, support us on Patreon to get access to a whole bunch of bonus episodes. Um, but my uh, background is in talking about talking about culture and how it intersects with politics and how we can think um, around the material history and practices of culture to wor work towards kind of revolutionary politics. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are new to Rev Left or you haven't heard the multiple discussions we've had with John, uh, I encourage you to go back. And, and look at them because every single one has been a, a fascinating deep dive into really interesting topics, as this one will be as well. And, and also, if you haven't 
uh, subscribe to and listen to Horror Vanguard. Highly, highly, highly recommend. It's good to have you back. It's It's been a long time. When was the last time? It, was, it has to be over a year, right? Yeah, it's got to be over a year. I think it's back when we did the episode on um, Frederick Jameson yeah, and right. postmodernism. Mm-hmm. So that's 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 way way back in the day. That's a real deep cut. <laughs> yeah, it is. And I've and since then I've got to talk to Kim Stanley Robinson, the sci-fi author whose mentor was Jameson, and uh, that was really interesting to hear his take on Jameson and how much of a mentor and friend that Jameson was to Kim Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, so uh, check that episode out as well if you're interested in any of that. But yeah, we have to have you on at least once a year, uh, and I'm going to maintain <laughs> that as long as Rev Left exists. But today. We are talking about John Berger. Is that the correct way to say his name? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, right. Perfect. So this is somebody who I actually hadn't heard about him before we started recording. We talked about how, you know, he has he has a much more you know, sort of influence and impact perhaps in, in Europe and throughout that region, but is not as well known in the U.S. for, you know, some interesting reasons or, or reasons that we might not be able to put our finger on. Um, so I think a lot of people in the U.S. might not know about him, or if they've heard of him, might not know much more than that. So first and foremost, who was John Berger? What were his politics, and why should folks on the left know about him? Okay, yeah. So so um, John Berger is, in probably in my opinion, one of the one of the most interesting Marxist uh, writers of the 20th century. So he um, was born between uh, the wars. He was. Uh, he was also a soldier in, in World War II, where he spent his time with working class uh, recruits, uh, often writing their letters home for them, as uh, many of them were illiterate. Um, he considered himself a, a storyteller. That was pr- principally how he identified, but he's, his politics were also very committed to Marxist revolutionary politics for, for, for a huge stretch of his writing. Um, he was an art critic uh, and re- a reviewer. He was a translator. Uh, him and his partners translated a lot of particularly German uh, philosophy and Marxism uh, into English for the first time. He was also a novelist, a playwright, a filmmaker, uh, and he uh, was responsible, I think, for kind of transforming how people think about the relationship of the individual and culture to the art in it that's produced within it. If you've never seen it, I can't. I can't recommend starting with um, his 1972 television series "Ways of Seeing Enough." Uh, if you want to, if you want to change how you think about the entirety of of, of you know Western art tradition, um, so uh, kind of a really he he then left England. He left England um, and spent a huge amount of his life uh, living in uh, rural France in uh, a. Uh, a farming village, as he put it, living among uh, the peasantry and the rural poor. Um, and that's the uh, area out of a lot of, that's the kind of area that a lot of his politics and a lot of his uh, writing emerges from. Um, so he he lived at, at, as a kind of European rather than English writer. That's how he identified. He was a kind of internationalist. Um, and as you pointed out, he's not incredibly well known in the States, which I think is a real shame, but he's incredibly well known uh, across Turkey, lots of the Middle East, uh, lots of Europe, and draws from a kind of really diverse range of influences and ideas to create a distinctively uh, kind of Marxist body of work. Yeah, absolutely. And and something I, I learned uh, during prep for this, and something I think you alluded to a little bit there, giving all of his the things that he does, is just how wide-ranging his interests are, like just how wide-ranging his his scope is to to analyze and and think about things and and can you talk a little bit about that before we move on just just the amount of different things <laughs> yeah, that he talked it's, about it's it's absolutely it's absolutely uh, incredible the the range of stuff that he he covers so he wrote novels he um he wrote works of uh political or aesthetic theory he wrote about great artists uh going over 400 years he wrote plays um he uh translated poetry and wrote his own poetry so um as i put it before we started recording he was he was what we might kind of think of as a polymath he was interested in a huge amount of 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 stuff uh you know landscapes to philosophy to uh revolutionary movements uh in latin america to solidarity with palestinians to so um as he put it to be a to be a polymath is to be interested in everything and nothing else (laughs) 
Uh, so he, he tried to encompass an incredibly broad range of experiences in his work and writing. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, to by no means am I to the degree that, that he was, but I really tried to foster within myself an uh, ongoing, deep sense of like learning about as much as I can and, and have these little periods of, of time, weeks or months where I get fascinated by a certain topic and then weave mm-hmm. that into my overall, you know, analysis and understanding of the world. And I think all Marxists specifically, but people more broadly, should attempt to at least be a lifelong learner and to continue opening up these new spheres of interest for yourself, which you can consciously do and you can consciously cultivate. Um, I think it's really, really important to be a well-rounded human being in general. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think this is what makes his work so interesting is that it's been incredibly widely received. Um, so, um, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, he was involved in like artistic debates over things like Soviet realism. Um, he he's made uh, books on uh, migrants and uh, displaced people. He's made photojournalistic studies of doctors in how uh, they work with patients. And I think it's important to see, you know, if we want to have a kind of broad conception, you know, uh, the the Jamesonian word we use is totality, right? If we want to try and understand kind of the unified whole of human consciousness and existence. Um, and how we might salvage that from the kind of sledgehammer that is capitalist alienation. I think having that kind of polymathic interest and being, um, being, being humble, you know, he described himself as a storyteller. He was there to kind of pass on the, uh, the stories and ideas and things that he'd found elsewhere, uh, requires a kind of intellectual humility that I think is super important for anyone who's interested in kind of, um, radical or revolutionary politics to try and pursue. Absolutely. I like the idea of that Jamesonian dialectical totality. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. John, I think about the patch of light on the wall and how you painted it yellow. I also think of Alice in her cradle. The yellow you painted is like a name you gave the light. No? No colour represents light. And light would vote for none. Or maybe it would vote for black. Because black, by opposition, really makes one imagine light. However, the yellow is a beautiful name, high up there on the wall. Behind black, there's light. But doesn't something equivalent happen always with colour? Isn't the colour always behind what we see, on the far side? It's as if all the colours, and particularly the pure ones, are waiting to undress or be undressed. Maybe the colour gold is special, associated with magic and the sacred, because it's the exception. What is on the other side of the gold is the same as what is on this side. Gold is naked from the start, the only one. Let's go ahead and move on. Obviously, a huge element of his work is is art criticism, and obviously the the term sort of speaks for itself, but for those who only have a vague or hazy idea of what exactly that is, can you talk a little bit about what art criticism is before we get into Marxist art criticism? Yeah, totally. So there there are generally two ways that, that things get talked about, right? Um, and to, when we talk about art, we don't necessarily have to be talking about the stuff you might see in a gallery you know, the stuff that's old or, um, you know, done by the painter's names that we might uh, learn in school. Um, but generally, there are two ways that this kind of thing is talked about. So uh, especially online, you get what I call kind of taxonomic criticism, where the sort of function of the writing is to ascertain where some, whether something is good or bad. You know, you you maybe like look up some reviews of that movie that you're going to go and see. And from that, you decide whether it's going to be worth spending your money on. Um, That's one type. And then a a second type is probably what we might call kind of more 
traditional or kind of classical criticism where we talk about the reasons uh, why we place value judgments on certain works of art, the standards of uh, of what those value judgments are. Um, and a lot of this gets uh, turned into questions of kind of canon. You know, in, in, in literature, we're talking about quote unquote classic literature. It's stuff that has been given a kind of critical significance by virtue of a certain quality. So criticism is is not just a kind of taxonomy where we go, like is this is 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 thing good or bad, but it's all, uh, but it can also be a kind of broader category where we go right. What are the qualities of a given object or art piece? What are the what's the significance of it? In essence, what does this thing kind of mean? That's what that those are kind of two two I think of the sort of common sense uh, understandings of the term like art criticism. Absolutely. And then, of course, there is, as there is with film theory and many other things, a Marxist version of this. So can you talk about the Marxist art criticism, sort of why it's important and, and you know, also what Berger's specific contributions to Marxist art criticism were? So uh, Marxism isn't interested in, in these, these kind of like idealized discussions about canon, you know, uh, it's, but it's interested in the kind of material and historical questions of how is how does meaning emerge from given art, and uh, what function does art kind of serve? So a, a really a really great quote from Berger that I love is um, from an old television appearance of him uh, when he was kind of at the height of his fame, and he said, "the ra- the ranking of artists in an order of merit seems to me to be an idle game. What matters uh, is are the questions that art answers." Right, that's what's important. What is the relationship between the historical and social conditions in which we live and the art that's produced? How do those two things interact? And what should the function of art be if we want to understand things kind of materially? So when Berger first emerged, the big kind of art debate was between two sides, modernism on the one hand and um, social or even Soviet realism on the other hand. Uh, and so the kind of traditional art establishment would say that actually modernism, which was often very abstract, uh, quite difficult, uh, often opaque in its meaning, was the product of kind of liberal democratic capitalism. And Soviet or social realism was an expression of a kind of totalitarian aesthetic that wanted everybody to look the same. And Burgess' point was actually, for the vast majority of working people, art has no kind of significance. And that's not the failure of uh, those working people, it's the failure of art to speak meaningfully to them. And he said that actually uh, social realism, um, what in Britain was called the kitchen sink painters, or and you know what in uh, the Soviet Union was called Soviet realism, was answering a specific need for artists to be connected to the wider body of people. So I hope that kind of like offers some kind of potential ways into thinking about what what is. And how how could we expand that to start thinking not just about visual art or visual media, but like culture generally, I think is a really interesting way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some like examples for of, for people out there of like obvious forms of like modern art for people to sort of get more of a, of a bearing with regards to that specifically? So um, obviously uh, the, 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 the big uh, innovation uh, this is a really kind of obvious Marxist point, which is tech- technology and the totality of a society will impact upon the kinds of art that get made. And the big technological leap forward in terms of, um, particularly in terms of realism, was the camera and then later the movie camera, right? So if we're talking about if we're talking about visual art, we're probably not talking about painting anymore. Um, and it's not a surprise that contemporary painting... It has increasingly gone into into very abstract directions. Uh, So what we have increasingly are things like installation art or we have things like sculpture. But really, really contemporary forms of art, uh, we're talking about photography, we're talking about film, talking about sound or, or music installations, because the technology by which we create art, by which art becomes integrated into the totality of social practice, has 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 moved forward. So we shouldn't be trying to think about this to, only in terms of how does this help us understand the past, but but how does this help us understand um, the images that we're surrounded by every day? 
one of the points that Berger makes in Ways of Seeing is um, advertising, right? The, the majority of the techniques of classical visual art, um, which or, or what he calls um, European oil painting, which has a very specific historical um, emergence and decline, have fed over into advertising. Uh, so uh, if you don't have a kind of critical understanding and, a, and an ability to engage with uh, the visual language that we're surrounded by all the time, you become, it's very easy for you to slip into the role of just being a passive consumer. Absolutely. And you mentioned right there uh, ways of seeing, and you mentioned it earlier in this episode as well. And that's one of the things I watched. It's free on online, a four-part BBC series. Um, can you just tell us about what that is and, and why it's so valuable and sort of some of the the main themes and arguments of that piece? Yeah. So uh, a lot of it is very heavily influenced by Walter Benjamin's um, essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction, right? It was a four-part television series that Berger made for the BBC uh, in the early 70s. And it basically seeks to get rid of the idea that art is this ahistorical and eternal category of, quote-unquote, aesthetic beauty. Rather, he talks about art is bound up, this tradition of art is bound up within questions of, of land ownership, um, within um, questions of wealth and within questions of patriarchy, um, uh, colonialism. Uh, so he, he talks about art in material terms, right? It's about instead of treating it as this kind of rarefied image that has to be protected and, and shuffled away into a gallery where, you have to, where they can be traded around like a commodity among the ultra rich or you have to pay a huge amount of money in order to gain access to them. Um, images are have proliferated technologically and have been spread all across our kind of daily existence. So what we need is that we need a material understanding of them. You know, the 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 really famous example he uses is of Holbein's uh, picture, the Ambassadors, uh, which comes up in the show, and he talks about this not in terms of like it's a great example of portraiture, but he talks about it in terms of an exhibition of political, patriarchal, colonialist wealth. Um, and this is why, actually, Berger always said that paying attention to kind of classical art is important because that tradition is how the uh, kind of capitalist bourgeois classes of centuries past have understood themselves, right? Um, painting became a possession that you could own and what it reflected back to you was yourself. Um, this is why this is why uh, Berger has a really good point in um uh, the book of ways of seeing about the gold, uh, the gilt frames that these pi pictures were often put within. So you link your kind of aesthetic tastes as a demonstration of wealth. Um, so what it's really, really good for is is kind of stripping away this mystification, this idealization of of, of aesthetics and art generally into a kind of mystified category that we need experts to come and explain to us. Um, there's a there's a great moment in the show where he just sits down with a bunch of children and asks them what they think art means. And it's about helping people make the connection that actually visual media is is not this ahistorical category, but is intricately bound up within the historical development of capitalism itself. You know, something that I, I thought about when you were, when you were talking about that, and I haven't done too much deep diving into this, but I've heard that like modern art, especially abstract expressionism, was clandestinely funded and promoted by the CIA, especially during the, the Cold War. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, there's some super interesting stuff on, um, uh, I think it's called the Congress for Cultural Freedom, mm -hmm. um, which was, uh, they, the, the CIA were interested in kind of creating a, an anti-Soviet left, basically. You know, it was fine to be, a, uh, to be left wing. They'd even help propagate various journals across the world uh, that you know would publish notable figures and writers and artists, um, but they would they're kind of trying to create a kind of wedge issue here. Um, whether that's the case with with um, expressionist and very abstract art is an interesting one because Berger actually changes his mind on a lot of modernist art, but precisely because of the influence of Picasso and Cubism, and he says actually just because. Uh, and it got him into trouble. Even even with uh, figures in Russia, they thought he was he was harboring dangerous liberal sympathies. But he was like, actually, 
it's expressing something that's true as well, and it has to be incorporated into a into a Marxist understanding of culture. So uh, it, it's true. There's pro, pro, there are almost certainly kind of documented historical links going on here, but I also think it's important to point out that art is not something that is given to us. Meaning, the meaning and and use of art is something that can be constructed and uh, by those who view it or those who engage with it. Um, so yes, that's absolutely part of it. And I think, I think it would be kind of naive to sort of dismiss that. But I also think given the, uh, given the nature of what it means to interpret art, there's, there's potentially scope for it to be recuperated as well. Uh, what, what do you think about it? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's more or less true, um, about the, the ability for it to be, to be recuperated. I think it is a, a historical fact. Um, that mm-hmm. that there yeah, was totally. like funding of people like uh, Jackson Pollock, for example, by the CIA, and it was this this concerted effort on, in the realm of art to fight against Soviet realism and and anything anything in, on any cultural front that could be a, a sort of a, an advancement of of socialism, Marxism, etc. So I, I, as I say, I don't know much about it, and I don't know much about the art world more broadly, but I always thought that that was an interesting thing to think about and to sort of see all the ways and all the fronts on which the CIA was fighting the cold war. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a whole episode that you could do uh, on like the Congress for cultural freedom. Um, like the, the, the Paris review, which is still an established uh, literary magazine was, was basically founded by um, OSS CIA spooks. Um, so like, but I also think um, Berger's, Berger was very committed to, to, to social realism for a very long time. And um, his interest then kind of moved to cubism because cubism was an exploration of not just space, but of time and space experience simultaneously. Um, and he writes a little bit on more contemporary artists, uh, but a lot of his interest bit then returns into kind of what we might call kind of canonical artists. Um, but that, that exploration of space and time and the experience that that renders into consciousness. Um, so, cause like the two big influences for him were uh, uh, Van Gogh and um, Picasso. Those were the kind of two artists that he writes about extensively. And I think it is really important to flag up that again, especially in Western Europe, especially in uh, North America's, like there, there was definite political significance, right, to the struggle over art, which is why it's important to not just dismiss it and not be like, well, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, you know, if your class enemies take it seriously, yeah. uh, then we should too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And recently, with the uh, with the whole Cuba situation going on, mm-hmm. I think it's been pretty well detailed that um, sort of branches of of the CIA or you know, related agencies like USAID and the NED have, have cultivated um, sort of a count, like a cultural network of artists and musicians and rappers and maybe even social media influencers to help push the sort of SOS Cuba, the latest uh, attempt to destabilize that country as well. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not something merely in the past. It's something that is uh, very clearly an, an ongoing uh, feature, which means that it must have some efficacy, you know. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that and that actually means that um having a, having an explicitly marxist understanding of the role and function of culture not as this idealized thing or not even as this delibidized apolitical kind of force for good, but understanding how artistic expression is married to like material forces of production and political and class struggle is is vitally important. Which is why revolutionaries have a role to play in the production of of art and culture. Um, you know, revolutionary musicians, artists, novelists. That that whole that runs the gamut of anything under the umbrella of art. Like that that is a front in the battle as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The first of March, nineteen ninety seven. Red is not usually innocent, but the red you sent me is. It's the red of childhood, a pretend red, or the red of young eyelids shut tight. The red you saw when you did that. 
As I look at it, I wonder what will happen when it grows older. Maybe it won't be red anymore. My guess is that maybe it will become black. Whereas this far from innocent red was maybe when it was young, white. White. With a touch of green, like apple blossom when it unfolds. Now, it's the heaviest red in the world. No bird could fly near it. Perhaps my favorite red is Caravaggio's. He uses it in painting after painting. The death of the Virgin in the Louvre, for example. The red by which you swear to love forever. The red whose father is the knife. The red which Nagib Mahfouz was thinking about in Cairo when he wrote, The beloved may absent herself from existence, but love does not. Could it be that red is the one color that is continually asking for a body? Give my special love at this moment to Genevieve. So let's go ahead and talk about the sort of polymathic dimensions of Berger and uh, his interests that we've mentioned a few times. What were some of Berger's other works um, and other other topics, social issues, questions, etc., that interested him and that he focused his uh, his mind on? Well, I think that there's there's so many that we could talk about, talk about, but there's just um, there's just a couple that I think are really worth um, flagging up. What I think is 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 probably um, his his best book and his most important book is a book called A Seventh Man. Um, so A Seventh Man is a uh, it's it's very it's quite odd. It's a combination of fiction um, and theory interspersed with uh, photographs. So, uh, so he collaborated hugely throughout his his career. And one of the most important people that he collaborated with was um, Jean Moyer, who was um, a photographer. So A Seventh Man is about the role and importance of migrant labor to the European uh, capitalist system. Um, and it follows um, usually people from rural Turkey or um, North Africa uh, going to for seasonal work in uh, Germany or Switzerland or France, northern Italy. Uh, what was called the Gasarbeiter, the uh, seasonal work uh, program that a lot of these European economies depended upon. Uh, you know, um, Geneva's sewer system was mostly built by migrant labor, people who did not have rights, people who were often hugely exploited, uh, people who were doing it because the global system of capitalism um, had uh, rendered it necessary for their own personal survival to do so. Uh, Berger makes a great point in this, um, in the in in the book that, when we talk about underdeveloped uh, countries, we should really be talking about um, the process of uh, by which they are underdeveloped. It didn't just happen, right? There are there are global systemic forces that have uh, pushed uh, these people out of their out of their villages and homes uh, into urban centres where they can be forced to do um, incredibly backbreaking, dangerous work used as a political wedge. Uh, issue against against uh, uh, workers from that country, um, and as Berger puts it, uh, the migrant sells their life in order to live. Um, so he wrote extensively about, um, as as he called it, uh, um, the rural and the peasants. Uh, and now this is supposed to be a category that kind of disappears. You know, if we take a very teleological and mecha- mechanistic view of Marxist uh, history. But he said, actually, you know, the peasantry as a class has kind of um, uh, been far more persistent than maybe people expected. Uh, this is why he he wrote about the Zapatistas. Um, he wrote about uh, rural workers in Turkey. He wrote about uh, the struggle for survival in Palestine. He wrote about um, the uh, kind of act of perception. He wrote an awful lot about um, history, 
And he tried to um, put that into either fiction or um, art criticism. Uh, so I really, I really recommend *A Seventh Man*. I think it's, I think it's an incredibly powerful book because the image, images and words kind of work together. Uh, it's almost like, it's almost like reading it is almost like watching. A, it's like having a book that is also a film at the same time because you, you get to to follow these these. It's you, he, as he puts it, it's it's usually men, even though there's a huge amount to be written on kind of like the uh, from a feminist um, point of view of the role of women in this process. But it's these men who kind of go off to another country and try and save enough so that they can either bring family to them or they can go back uh, with the money that they've saved. But they will almost certainly have to do that year after year after year. So it's like um, it's he covers a whole host of different ranges. Um, he's written about animals as well, quite movingly, because, uh, you know, if you're if you live in a very rural uh, peasant community, the environment is a very pressing concern. So um, environmentalism, history of poetry, history of art, the relationship between humans and animals, uh, the relationship of uh, people from wildly different cultures brought together by capitalism, uh, workers' rights, uh, revolutionary political movements. Uh, there's, you know, he was writing for, for since he was in his, he, he was writing from the point he was in his 20s to when he died um, uh, in his 90s. So there's this incredibly rich body of work to explore. Yeah. Um, I know one of the books I'm interested in, in getting after doing prep for this episode is The Shape of a Pocket, which mm-hmm. I believe was a correspondence with Subcomandante Marcos of the, of the Zapatistas. Yeah. Um, so that's that's incredibly interesting. And uh, I've read some quotes about Berger from the book and, and talking about the book, and it seems incredibly interesting. You mentioned he wrote about animals. I don't know if you've read a lot of his work on that front, but can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm just interested in that in that aspect of his work. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually just going to bring up the, the, the essay. It's a very short piece sure. uh, called Why Look at Animals? Um, and he makes the point that um, increasingly uh, people don't really look at animals. But the, the, biggest, the biggest kind of change to that is pets. It says that actually having a pet is a very modern invention because um, it's something that emerges in the, in the 19th century. But previously, our relationship with animals is much more um, based on issues of mutual survival, right? Um, if you're a farmer who raises pigs, he says you, you, be, you, are, you are grateful to look upon the pig uh, and to, to salt it for the winter after, after the animal has been, has been killed. And he says, actually, th- th- those two things have an and between them, not, not a but. So there is... There is Often, often, I think human-animal relationships gets co- collapsed down into making an absolute equivocation between between humans and animals being relatively the same, or there's this kind of realm of absolute distance and difference between them. And Berger says that, like, we look at animals at the zoo because we don't really see them anymore. They've been removed from the daily sphere of our existence, and they kind of, and that's a shame because it means that we have this kind of humanistic arrogance in how we look at animals and we can see them as things for our consumption or our entertainment. When in fact, historically we've always had a much closer relationship uh, with animals than that. Um, So yeah, here's here's the quote from the essay. The vestiges of this dualism remain among those who live intimately with and depend upon animals. A peasant becomes fond of his pig and is glad to salt away its pork. What is significant and is so difficult for the urban stranger to understand is that those two statements in that sentence are connected by an and and not a but. So he said that actually, uh, in in many ways, we've we've always lived very closely with animals, but that's diverged. And so we now have a kind of distance from them. And that distance has, has kind of resulted in a sort of humanist arrogance where we kind of place ourselves above them rather than uh, alongside them. Um there's a there's another great quote here about uh, zoos. You know, you go to look at the animals, but the animals don't look at you. Um, and he, he says, you know, if you take your children to the zoo, what do they say? They go, oh, it's it's boring. Is it dead? Why isn't it moving? And it's like, because, well, what you have is you have a simulation of the ways in which we would often look at animals and experience the animal looking back at us. Um, or, or we have kind of uh, pets that we can condition to anthropomorphize. Um, and, you know, this is all coming from experience. You know, he's he's someone who who wasn't just a kind of like 
anthropologist in 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 the the the, the uh, French mountains. You know, he lived and worked alongside farmers, so he was very familiar with with the kind of like historical and long term relationship between humans and animals. And it's a it's a very short essay, but I really I really recommend it because it's immensely thought provoking. Zoos, realistic animal toys, and the widespread commercial diffusion of animal imagery all began as animals started to be withdrawn from daily life. One could suppose that such innovations were compensatory, yet in reality the innovations themselves belonged to the same remorseless movement as was dispersing the animals. The zoos, with their theatrical decor for display, were in fact demonstrations of how animals had been rendered absolutely marginal. The realistic toys increased the demand for the new animal puppet, the urban pet. The reproduction of animals in images, as their biological reproduction in birth becomes a rarer and rarer sight, was competitively forced to make animals ever more exotic and remote. Everywhere, animals disappear. In zoos, they constitute the living monument to their own disappearance. And he wasn't just kind of grousing about zoos for the sake of it, but showing how our relationship with animals is constituted historically. And, and those shifts didn't just happen. They shifted those shifts in that relationship were conditioned through the development of capitalism as an economic force, right? Greater urbanization, greater efficiencies in production, mass production, uh, all resulted in this, in this kind of strange dislocation where humans can, ver- can very frequently live in a world that seems very removed from the rest of nature that lives alongside it. Absolutely. And I think that shift was represented in philosophy by someone like Rene Descartes, who talks about animals as, as automatons and the, the famous sort of Cartesian dualism that, that's more broadly this split between the body and the mind within the human itself. And that separation is also no doubt, um, at least to some psychological extent, played a role in the mass extinction event that is, that is playing out now. And I heard as I was reading a, a book recently uh, I think it's called the end of the world or end of worlds about all the mass extinctions that have happened throughout Earth's history, the five main mass extinctions plus the the one we're engaged in now. And as of right now, one of the facts that stood out to me is three percent of the animal biomass are constituted by wild animals, and ninety seven percent of the animal biomass still on Earth today are humans, our pets, and our agricultural animals. Um, and, and I think that you know you cannot separate all of what you said and that reality from the broader reality of ecological collapse, climate change, and and the sort of disregard of the the health of the natural planet more broadly. I just got back from from Mexico, and uh, earlier this year I went to the Pacific Northwest, and I got chances to be out on the ocean um, and, you know, kayak with wild dolphins and wild seals. In Mexico, I got to swim with a dolphin, and I saw a, a sea turtle, a little baby sea turtle, making his way uh, to the to the water, and I actually helped him get into the water. And it's just a it's just a fascinating uh, sort of thing. And it really, when when you spend time with animals, particularly in the wild, outside of the context of of zoos, um, you just get this deep connection and love, and this profound sense of I'll do anything to protect the uh, the the habitat of this animal and the biosphere more broadly. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's I think it's this um this short essay like i say you can find it online um why look at animals is is really really good and really thought provoking in making you kind of self reflect and go you know what exactly is is the relationship that i have with with animals what do, what do i see when i look at them and maybe more troublingly what did they see when they look back at me um and i think like i say he doesn't he doesn't collapse things down into an easy dualism and you know, um, obviously, is not dismissing things like zoos or conservation ha- habitats out of out of hand. Sure, but showing how they serve as kind of a a, 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 a metaphor for for how the relationship of you know humans and animals historically has been has shifted into something that's often so far removed. Um, and that 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 is is a kind of chasm that's been opened up. Uh, but that isn't like just the kind of individual thing, but it has its own historical genealogy. Today I'll try to apply to your blue only with words, without a colour. Yeah. Eve Klein's blue. <laughs> 
is dense. It's the color of an object, not a space. It's so densely blue, I'd say, that it accuses. Everything else except the fact of blue has been eliminated. And somehow, Klein feels that this is the spectator's fault. To put it another way, maybe Klein's blue is a paranoid color, particularly when it's dark. Its pale version is less accusing, but it affords no peace. It nags, nags. There are, I think, erotic blues, but I can't exactly remember them. Can you? The blue of a certain kind of clematis is erotic. Erotic blue, of course, has nothing to do with blue films. The blue of blue films, if it existed. That would be quite like Klein's blue. The blue of the forbidden. Again, paranoia. Blue is perhaps jewel. Blue is perhaps adornment. But blue is also modesty, the robe of the Madonna. And perhaps exactly, it's this play between these two opposites which makes for the erotic, I don't know. Yes. Now I've remembered. The blue of blueberries is sexy. A blue dress ceases to be purely blue when it follows the form of a live body. a prize, not a public one, an intimate prize. Blue says outrageously and absurdly, I am yours, or you are mine. And no other can judge us. And there's an impromptu by Schubert, which talks exactly about this. And Charlie Parker became bird because he knew about blue. For Genevieve and you with my love. Let's go ahead and move on. And one of the things that I didn't get a chance to look too deeply into, but that you mentioned in our goings back and forth before we uh, recorded this episode is Berger's connections to the British Black Panthers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So Berger, Berger has, has left, left, leaves England and he leaves England basically under a bit of a cloud. He has been kind of castigated uh, for being a kind of Bolshevik for a very long time. And has been seen as this kind of like, polemical bomb thrower you know um and he leaves england and he um 
enters an incredibly productive part of his career. For five years, he's working on a novel. Um, the novel is called G, um, and it wins the Booker Prize. Uh, for people who don't know, the Booker Prize is probably the biggest literary prize in uh, the UK. Um, it's it's an incredibly high profile event, full of like the uh, you know the the intelligentsia and the the the, the bourgeois elite of the of, of the cultural scene. Um, Berger uh, accepts the prize and gives a speech where he says that um, the Booker Prize comes from the Booker Foundation, which has had historically long uh, holdings in the Caribbean, and that the the money is a direct result of the the vicious exploitation and enslavement of peoples in the Caribbean. And he says that his next project was going to be the book A Seventh Man, where he was going to travel around Europe uh, talking with and photographing migrant workers. And he said, you know, to, to take this money would be to fund art on the back of money that comes from the exploitation of others. Uh, so for that reason, he, he decides to give it to, he splits the prize money. So he, he splits uh, half of it, cover his costs to make the next book. And the other half he gives to the revolutionary group um, with whom he finds his politics in closest alignment, which is the British Black Panthers. Um, and it it causes this kind of, like enormous scandal uh, by the standards of the day. And he says that to, that um, you know uh, someone from the British Black Panthers was there at the ceremony and kept t- t- trying to tell him to like calm down, you know, just chill out, <laughs> it's be fine. Uh, but he's like he, made, he makes it very clear that he does it as a kind of revolutionary writer, as someone who who wants to further uh, the struggle for for uh, black liberation. Um, so it's and it's an incredibly high profile event. You know, he leaves England again and he goes off to travel, but it's still something that is always brought up. This happens in the 70s. And it's and it's a kind of rare moment of like someone from a very traditionally sort of like high cultural mode. You know, he was um, he you know, on, on the surface, he's a he's a kind of he's a middle class art writer who's written a novel that's gotten a prize from, you know, the middle and upper literary classes but uses it as an opportunity uh, to talk about uh, colonialism, extractive colonialism specifically, and to link that explicitly to political struggles that were going on in the country at the time. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned he, he leaves England and, and goes around the continent. You've talked a bit about uh, his work around migrant labor in particular. Do you have anything more to say on that particular topic and specifically so can you just talk about more about his travels and, and where it took him? Yeah, he kind of creates, I've, I've got the book in my hand at the moment. Um, it's, it's a genuinely, it's a genuinely incredible piece of, of, you know, of art. And it's, um, there is, there is uh, some very beautiful and very kind of moving photographs. It shows the kind of degrading tests that companies would um, perform on people who were willing to submit to migrant work. Uh, so um, he starts off in in kind of Turkey and in North Africa, where particularly German firms were desperate for uh, workers because there was a labor shortage. Um, but they could be they were useful because they were often very isolated from other workers from workers in the countries they'd be working in, and they were desperate. They needed the they needed the work because of the various kind of systemic structures that had, uh, as, uh, like I say, as Berger had put it, had underdeveloped as an active verb, right? If a country has been, quote unquote, is, quote, unquote, underdeveloped, according to, to, to a set of, you know, IMF standards, the question we should be asking is underdeveloped by whom and for what reasons? Because that takes you into the realm of understanding those individual stories on a kind of global, uh, on, the, on, on the level of the global totality of how capitalism operates as a cross-border phenomenon. It was reissued in uh, 2010, and it was um, uh, kind of enormously prescient. And Berger wrote a kind of wrote, wrote a small forward, and the very end of the forward for the 2010 edition says, "Today the book is being republished, and will find new readers. Amongst them, there will be young emigrants who were not born when it was first published. They will easily see what has changed and what has not changed, and they will recognize the heroism, self-respect." and despair of the protagonists who could have been their parents. And this recognition will help sustain them in their moments of panic and at other moments increase their indomitable courage. 
uh, I really can't recommend it enough. I think it's a very beautiful piece of work. Absolutely. Berger is, is often described, and I really want to get your thoughts on this specifically, is described as a Marxist humanist. And we've done episodes on the topic of revolutionary humanism in juxtaposition to the failures and weaknesses of liberal humanism, etc. But do you think that term fits Berger? Why or why not? And, and what are your thoughts on Marxist humanism more broadly? I mean, I'm super sympathetic to it. Um, so, like, it's often used in relationship to Berger because he's someone who writes very movingly about the kind of beauty of the world. You know, the beauty of art, um, the, the the kind of beauty of human existence. Um so it's it's but it but it's um humanism is about the kind of elevation of the human right and Berger kind of staunchly resists this you know you mentioned before we started recording um like uh, about the links to Spinoza like his favorite f- philosopher was Spinoza he writes a really uh, interesting short th- book of kind of thoughtful reflections called Bento's sketchbook which is all about Spinoza where there's there is this kind of complete rejection of Cartesian dualism, this this idea that all is all material. The world is all material, nothing else. So he's not he's not someone, you know, the, the kind of obvious uh, critique of humanism is Althusser's critique of humanism. Yeah. Um, and Althusser, like Berger, was, was a big fan and influenced by Spinoza. However, if he's a humanist, he's a humanist for a human that has not yet come into existence. So it's it's a humanism for the future. Right. Not not the idea of like humans now being better than the rest of the world, but the idea that um, that there is the great possibility of transforming the world and thus the the human subjects and human consciousness that lives in it. Um, And in that, I think there's some really interesting links between Berger and the German uh, Marxist philosopher Walter Benjamin. So there's this great uh, short article that Berger writes called um, 12 Theses on the Economy of the Dead. Um, And then I want to follow it with a quote from Benjamin. How do the living lie with the dead? Until the dehumanization of society by capitalism, all the living awaited the experience of the dead. It was their ultimate future. By themselves, the living were incomplete. Thus, living and dead were interdependent, always. Only a uniquely modern form of egotism has broken this independence with disastrous results for the living who now think of the dead as eliminated. And a quote here from Walter Benjamin. In every era, the attempt must be made anew to wrest tradition away from a conformism that threatens to overpower it. Only that historian will have the gift of fanning the spark of hope in the past, who is firmly convinced that even the dead will not be safe from the enemy if he wins, and this enemy has not ceased to be victorious. Like, the thing that... that, uh, kind of drives a lot of Berger's writing, in my opinion, is this notion of, like, what might humans... Not 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 what are humans, but what might humans become? What can consciousness uh, experience? How might, how, might, how might the future be different? And even if it's a possible future, you know, even if it's a possible future that is kind of eliminated viciously, even at, at its moment of instantiation, there is the glimpse of, of, of something on the horizon that is made manifest if only for a second if if you know if it's it's the light of a potential future that that sparks in the dark present even if it vanishes um so to to say that he's a humanist i think is a massive reduction and it's often a way of going oh well he thought that you know there there was beauty in the world as well as the kind of endless grinding barbarism of capitalism but i also think you know th- this idea of of if he was a humanist, it's for a human who does not yet kind of live is is maybe the way that I would try and think about it. Yeah, I really like that that framing of being a humanist for a sort of human that that hasn't existed yet. And and by extension, logically, we can and, and in some sense must bring into uh, the world through revolutionary transformation, internal and external, I believe. Uh, yeah, so I really like that, and and you know, Walter uh, Benjamin is somebody who we have not gotten to yet on the show, and maybe I could have you back on at some point to dive into to him and his life and his legacy, because he's a massively influential thinker for people on the left and Marxists in particular. Mm-hmm. I like to end a conversation like this and with a with a sort of reflective question, which is ultimately, 
what were John Berger's contributions to the left and how has he influenced you personally or perhaps put another way, why are his contributions so important and why should they be valued by the left today? So I think, one, to understand that art is not just a kind of rarefied practice but is bound up within our politics. Um, and I think the, the importance of that for the left goes back to the old uh, textile strike of the early 20th century where, you know, 20, what, 26,000 workers go out and strike and one of them is carrying a sign that says, bread, yes, but roses too, uh, which is then later immortalized in the, in the kind of famous IWW song, Bread and Roses, um, which includes the, the amazing line, hearts, hearts starve as well as bodies. Um, so the the whole point is not uh, simply to reduce our our struggle for liberation down to uh, a matter of abolishing a system of economics, but actually uh, that touches upon every other aspect of our being. Um, and I think the the uh, the Im- impact I think is how do you look at the world? You know, how do we look at the world? Do we look at it with um, uh, attentiveness uh, to to look and see where we might find? Uh, you know, fragments of hope. And hope is not just a kind of fleeting emotive word, but hope is a practice. It is something that is enacted and something that is lived out. Um, it, there's a kind of persistence to it. And uh, for Berger, he, you know, he found it in some of the most remarkable places. He found it in, uh, you know, the the face of a, of a doctor who was desperately trying to keep his rural patients alive. He found it um, helping with with farming in, in rural France. He found it looking at the uh, incredible achievements of the Zapatistas, uh, Palestinian struggles for liberation. And he found it looking at the art and and in the history of our past. So to, to look at the world, I mean, it's ways of seeing that he's most known, known for, but to challenge your own way of seeing is not simply to kind of like think and reduce everything down to what Berger would call the aesthetics of the 19th century, you know, to, to join in with that taxonomic sorting of like which cultural objects are good and bad or which are on our side of the political divide and which aren't, but to actually think deeper and harder and more dialectically about the things that we encounter. Um, and those things can be things that we encounter in the street. Um, there's a great uh, piece that he wrote in May 1968 called The Nature of Mass Demonstrations. And he said that protests, mass demonstrations were not simply uh, an appeal to the democratic conscience of the state, but they were a rehearsal for revolution. The demonstration congregates in public to create its function. Uh, And he says the demonstrators interrupt the regular life of the street they march through or of the open spaces they fill. They cut off those areas and not yet having the power to occupy them permanently, they transform them into a temporary stage on which they dramatize the power that they still lack. The demonstrator's view of the city surrounding the stage also changes. By demonstrating, they manifest a greater freedom and independence, a greater creativity, even although the product is only symbolic than they can ever achieve individually or collectively when pursuing their regular lives. In their regular pursuits, they only modify circumstances. By demonstrating, they symbolically oppose their very existence to circumstances. So it's like you can you can dismiss a protest, but like you look at it with care and attention and it unlocks into something that shows huge amounts of potential. And I think that's that's the most important thing about Berger's work. You know, the, the, the call to reflect and to challenge our own way of seeing, to look more carefully, with more attention and with more regard and to see where we're looking, where we might find the possibility of uh, a better future. Absolutely. Beautifully said, my friend. What would you recommend to someone who wants to get into Berger? I know we talked about ways of seeing free online, anything above and beyond that. And then also, can you please let listeners know where they can find you and your wonderful work online? Um, uh, so I was reading about Berger and, and came across someone who said that maybe the best way, um, maybe the best way to to find Berger is to just stumble across him one day, <laughs> um, and you can you can find so many of his short pieces, or you might find an old book somewhere. But if I had to recommend things, I would recommend um, A Seventh Man, which I think is incredibly important, um, especially in the context of capitalism's endless demand for kind of a a, a liquid pool of labor that it can pull across uh, national borders. Um, I would really recommend his 
writing from the post 2000s on Palestine, which you can just find by by just Googling stuff. Um, and if you love uh, fiction, he writes in the mid 90s, he writes a very beautiful novel called To the Wedding, um, which uh, deals with uh, HIV and AIDS. Um, it's it's uh, an incredible piece of writing. It's maybe one of the best books I've read this year. Uh, but there is so much of his work out there. Um, and I think I don't I don't want people to to feel like there there has to be a reading list. Uh, find his name somewhere and see where it takes you. Um, and yeah, you can find me online at the Liquid Guy. And uh, as I said, I'm also the co-host of uh, Horror Vanguard. We're on Twitter at Horror Vanguard, and you can find Horror Vanguard if you love spooky movies, spooky theory, and the great monster that is uh, communism stalking Europe. Still, <laughs> uh, you can find that on any good podcast platform. John, it is always an honor and a pleasure. Uh, this has been a fascinating introduction to a, a thinker and a, a Marxist who I was unaware of before you said, let's do an episode on him. And I'm thankful to you for that. I'll continue to dive into his work and I'll probably do something on Patreon where I do a little bit of his reading to continue to uh, advance and introduce him to, to more Americans specifically. So thank you so much. Let's not wait another year until we do this again. There's a million <laughs> topics we can talk about and I always enjoy it. Quite right. Thank you so much. Seventeenth of June, nineteen ninety seven. Your darkness in different languages and different degrees. Well, here's a short passage I was writing the other day, which has something to do with black. Give my love to Genevieve and the little one. When the sun set, the forest was filled with blackness, not with the color black, but with the mystery, the invitation of black. Blackness is in a black coat, as in black hair. As in a touching, you didn't know existed. Although Vika has gone, I hear her voice. This happens often. King, keep your mouth shut, she says. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about the color black, I say, and about sex.